evening. Hope everybody have a great, had a great Yom Kippur, meaningful Yom Kippur. We shall have a year of blessings with Hashem, endless blessings. And the Zerah Shemshon, she or does not stop. We continue over here. We're doing Parashat Ha'azinu, Be'ezat Hashem. Drush Gimel. Says the Zerah Shemshon. Parashat Ha'azinu is a very unique parasha. Um, it's a song. Ha'azinu literally means listen. Give ear, that's what it means, give ear. Moshe Rabbeinu is asking the Jewish people to give their ear to listen to the last things he has to say. And uh, it's a song, it's written in song form, it has stanzas, it has, if you've ever seen the Sefer Torah, it's written in two columns instead of versus one straight column. And the letters are very long, sometimes difficult to read, they're elongated in order to fit the structure of their columns. And uh, there's a lot of very serious topics that Moshe Rabbeinu talks about over there. He speaks about a lot of future events where uh, when Am Israel would make certain mistakes and they would uh, suffer as a result of it. So one of those verses is going to be analyzed by the Zerah Shemshon over here. It's uh, Devarim 32.17. It says over here, is behol ashidim lo eloah, which means they will uh, bring sacrifices to Shedim. Shedim is the word literally for demons, for dark spiritual angels. Um, but here it's being used in the context to, 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 uh, to mean false gods, Abu Dazara, idol worshipping, idolatry. So he's, uh, this verse is foretelling future events when, uh, when the Jewish people would unfortunately fall to Abu Dazara. So it says, They will give sacrifices to Shedim, to false gods that are not true gods. Perish Rashi, Rashi explained on the verse, Kitargomo, that the explanation of the verse goes according to the translation. Which translation? He's referring to the translation of Unculus, the Aramaic translation of Unculus. Which means, let behon troch. That's how Unculus translated it. What does it mean in Aramaic? Let behon troch. It means they have no power. Who's they? Those false gods. They have no power. Rashi continues, But if they did have power, then the kin'ah that God has on the people would not be doubled as it is now. Which means it's, God has a double kin'ah. He has a double kin'ah because of the fact that they are sacrificing to these false deities, to false gods. I mean, they have, and these false gods have no uh, way to repay you because they just have no power. They don't exist, right? they're not real. And therefore, they have no benefit to give to the person who's worshiping them. And therefore, it's an empty effort. And because it's an empty effort, God says, Rashi says that God's kin'ah is doubled. What does kin'ah mean? Kin'ah is a word that connotes a strong emotion, a strong passion. Literally, simply, it's used to mean, to mean jealousy. Kin'ah means jealousy. God is called El Kana, God of jealousy. And very interestingly, the Torah only uses that term. El Kana in context of idol worship, in the context of when the Jews will do idol worship, or if they less, you know, when the, when the Torah warns that they shouldn't do idol worship, God is called an El Kana, a jealous God, so to speak. But the word Kana, jealous, is one sort of manifestation of it, but the meaning is much more deeper. The word Kana, Kinar, also means strong emotion, like we said, not only jealousy, but also another English word that rhymes with that, zealous. Zealous means strong emotional feeling for something, right? For example, Pinehas is famously called as the, as the, the Kanai, the one who has very, is very zealous. Zealous for what? Zealous for upholding God's word. Zealous for Hashem, for bringing God's truth into the world. Right? That's, what, that's what gave him the moxie, the courage to go inside and stab the, you know, uh, Zimri and, uh, and Kozbi together in the act in a very, very difficult situation. If he got caught, he would have been killed. But you need to have extreme jealous, uh, zealousy, excuse me, kin'ah, same word. So in, in Hebrew, every word has a true core that comes out in many different uh, uh, angles and manifestations in the Torah, and in life, and in, and in meaning. And so the word kin'ah has those, those two meanings as, long as, as well as a few other meanings as well. But nevertheless, this kin'ah of God, his jealousy, so to speak, his strong emotion against those who, speak, who do idol worship is doubled when they, when Jewish people, give sacrifices to these false gods. That's what Rashi says. Makshim and Rashim, people ask the question, 
דהא איתא במדרש הבא, it says in the מדרש הבא, שמות רבה מ"ג ו"ו, it says, על פסוק, regarding the verse, למה אדוני יחרא אפך בעמך? Why Hashem should you throw your anger at your nation? What is that referring to? That's referring to after the sin of the golden calf. When Moshe is negotiating with God on Mount Sinai. And Moshe says to God, God, why are you throwing your anger? Why should you do that at your people? Amar Moshe, what it means, says the Midrash, what that line means, Ribbun Olamim, he meant to say, Master of the Universe, all they did was they made you a helper. They made you an assistant. And you're mad at them? They made your job a little easier, said Moshe. Interesting argument. This golden calf that they made, it's just going to be your assistant, your helper, your subsidiary. You can shine the sun, God, says Moshe to him. And the eagle can shine the moon at night. You can share with your responsibilities. You can shine the stars. And he can shine the constellations, the other parts of the galaxies and, and the space. You can bring down the dew in the morning. Very, you know, the, the very blessing uh, packed dew, water that comes upon the grass in the morning. And he will bring along the winds, you know. Basically, you delegate. You delegate some jobs for him. That was Moshe's argument. Very interesting. That midrash needs to be analyzed. The Zerash Hashem is going to give you one angle. Amar HaKadosh Baruch Hu, God said back to him in that midrash, back to Moshe, Even you are making a mistake regarding this calf to think that God, that I need some kind of assistance, I need some kind of help, I need some kind of manager. Don't you understand that this Egel has no substance, it's empty. It has no power to bring anything to them. God is the ultimate source of everything, above everything. He has the ultimate power. He is the owner. Right? Amarlo, Moshe said back to him, Im Ken, if that's so, that the, that the calf has no power, why are you, God, getting so angry at your people if the eagle has no power? Because it sounds from this, meaning Moshe was making an argument to God, saying, God, you just said yourself that this calf has no substance, has no power, has no true anything. So that's the case. Why are you getting upset at them? They're not doing anything. Since it has no substance, therefore it has no effect, it has no cause, what's the problem? Don't get so angry at them. So that's what Moshe is saying, that since, the, since there is, so Moshe is seeming to try to bring out the mercy of God with the argument that the false gods have no power. But that's a problem with the Rashi that we brought at the beginning of, of this uh, Shi'ur on the, on the verse in our, in our Parsha Hazinu, where that Rashi said that the only reason that God is angry, or God has kin'ah, that strong emotion, the double amount of it is because they're doing something that's empty. It's because the, the, the gods that they're worshipping have no power to give them anything. So it seems like opposite things. Moshe says, since they have no power of God, you shouldn't be angry. Rashi is saying, oh, since they have no power of God, is double angry. How do you reconcile this? If you preach Rashi, Adrabah mashmadi imken, imen bamamash, there should be a double anger, right? That's the question here. And the Zesh is going to try to answer the question. What does he say? According to how we're going to explain it, says Zesh there's no question. It says like this. In Abu Dazara 55a. It's written in your Torah. Okay, what's the story here? Let me explain to you the story. It says that Agrippas, a certain official, maybe it was a king, Agrippas asked Rabban Gamliel a question. He was a Roman king. He says to Rabban Gamliel, It's written in your Torah. I might have been a philosopher, I have to double check. It was a certain goy. He asked Rabban Gamliel, It's written in your Torah, El Kana, that God is a God of a jealous God, right? What I mentioned before. Klum, 
mitkane ela chacham bechacham. How does jealousy work? Said Agrippas to Rabban Gamliel. Doesn't jealousy only work within the same field? Meaning, for example, of a wise person can be jealous of another wiser person, like because he recognizes the skill, the talent, and the the uh, gift that another wise person has, maybe wiser than him. And he says, "Wow, I want to. I would like to be like that. I want his wisdom, right?" Gibor be Gibor, another example. One warrior could be jealous of another warrior. Right? Once you're in the field, you know what it takes to be in that field. You can look at someone else in that field that's above you and say, wow, wow I'm jealous of him. Right? One warrior to another warrior. But that's the case. How can God say he's a jealous God? How can God say, I am jealous when my nation worships other gods? Doesn't that give some credence, some substance, some reality to those fake gods? Otherwise, why should I be jealous of them? If there truly is no substance in them, if they're truly empty and worthless and meaningless, then why should God be jealous of them? That's his question. Very strong question. And Abang Gamila answered him, what did he say to him? He he said that the word kina, when God says el kana, I am a jealous God, that word kana, kuf nun alef, it means something else, similar to what I was saying in the beginning, that has multiple meanings. Here it doesn't mean jealous, rather it means zealous, emotional, feeling emotionally strong about something. It's not that he's jealous of those gods as if they have some, that those gods are real. That's not the, that's not the case, as I'm going to mean. They're not real, he's not jealous of them. He feels a zealousy, a strong emotion. What is that? Right. And he gave him an example. What does this mean? He says, imagine a, a person who married a woman. Man married a woman. And then he married another woman. He has two wives. But the second woman that he married, she was of a higher status. She had a more impo- higher level, important social, social, um, socio-economic status or a higher lineage, whatever the case is, that he married. And she was more important on a higher level than the second one. Then, I'm sorry, than the first one. The second one was a higher level than the first one. In Mitkan Abba, in this case, the first girl doesn't necessarily have jealousy. She doesn't have anger. She doesn't have strong, uh, zealous, I'm sorry. She doesn't have jealousy. A strong emotion towards that second girl because she understands that her husband married her because the second one is of a higher status. But, but if, let's say, now the husband married the second woman and the second woman is not a higher level prestigious woman, rather she's like some kind of very, very low class, this, uh, you know, uh, low class woman, lower than her. And he married her. Then, Mitkan Abba. Then, she feels this strong emotion. She gets angry at, at, at him and her. And saying, that you don't deserve my husband. You don't deserve him. You're, no, you're nothing. You're empty. You're, no, you're nobody. That's how she, the first girl feels. If the husband marries a low-class girl the second time. Same thing here with God. God knows the level and the worth of Am Yisrael. And when he sees them following after low-class, empty things, such as Abu Dazara, he get his, his kin'ah gets activated. He feels a strong emotion, like, how could you bring yourself down to this level? Not that he's jealous of that actual thing, of that, that he wishes he was that uh, other God, that, so that the Jewish people worship him, worship him instead. That's not the point. The point is that he feels emotional about who he cares and loves about, which is the people themselves. And here, in our case, it's the first woman for the husband himself. She feels that the husband is stooping down to a level below him, beneath him, not fitting for him, not suited for him, to go and marry that second low-class girl. That's the point over here. And that's how you explain Rashi over here. That's the zealousy that, that, the, that God is feeling, the double kin'ah that God feels when Am Yisrael goes for Abu Dazara. So how does that answer our question with Moshe Rabbeinu? How does that settle that? You must say, Right? When Moshe was saying to God, 
Why are you getting angry at your people if they're worshipping something that has no substance? You shouldn't be angry since it has no substance. Over there, that Hainu Bidavka Bavana Egil. That's referring specifically and only to that one sin of the idol worshipping of the golden calf, specifically. Why? Because Shilo Bikshu Ella Sheye Lahem Kemo Manhig Milvad. When the Jews first made the, the golden calf, their whole intent was that the golden calf should be a leader, so to speak, to lead them in the desert because they, they felt lost without Moshe because they, they thought Moshe died. And but the point is they never denied the Torah. And they never admitted that there's, that, that, that there's another power, another God besides the Gosh They still fully accepted God in their heart and that was still on their agenda. They just needed some sort of leader in the desert to lead them around to God, right? They never forget, forgot about and eliminated God from the picture. That's the point. This says over there in the Midrash. And there's more commentary there. Right? Meaning the Am Yisrael, the actual descendants of Yaakov, Bani Yisrael, they never took God out of the picture. It was only the Erev Rav, the mixed multitude of Egyptians that came along with them who were so deeply stupid in Abdazara that they actually worshipped the Egil, the golden calf, as a true God to, you know, taking God out of the picture. Because, and that was a very small percentage of them. And nevertheless, they caused a still, you know, still big repercussions, repercussions and punishments still happened, of course, as was proper, because nevertheless, it was a huge mistake, no matter how you explain it. But their kavana, their intent, was not um, of the actual Bnei Israel, not the Erev Rav, the actual Bnei Israel, their intent was not to forget about God. And therefore, you cannot say, that, and therefore, that's what Moshe was saying, that God, remember, they also know that, that, that there was no substance in it. They also know that you were the main substance. You were the main source and everything like that. And therefore, the whole story of the Golden Calf is an exception to this rule. And that's why Moshe made that argument. And therefore, it doesn't contradict Rashi, because Rashi is talking about when the Jews actually do real Abu Dazara, where over there, they're following emptiness. And that's why God's Kin'ah gets doubled, versus here, they never forgot about God. It was just a sort of a unusual situation. Good. Good. Right. It brings an, an idea to support the Rashi, which is a, a verse in Jeremiah 2.13. It says, what God says over there, that they left me, they left me. What am I, says God? He compares himself to the source of living waters, meaning the living wolf. A wellspring of water that gives life to everything. They left me to do what? To go quarry out and dig in the caves of empty, broken uh, pits with no water. Right? If you leave God to do anything else for the distractions of this world, right? The example there literally was Abu Dazara. That was the big etzerah of the time. Now it's other distractions. It's money, fame, women, etc. Phones, games, apps. You know, all these things distract us and take us away from God. And if you do that, the prophet would say about that, you're leaving the source of water, the actual source of life, to go carve out and dig empty, dry pits. The main idea we have to understand from this, from this edition of Shon, moving forward after this Yom Kippur and onwards, is that we see how much God values our time. If you don't value your time, you should know that God values you, values your time. Time is the most precious commodity in the world. You cannot make more of it. Whatever you have in this world, that's it. And therefore, in that time, and, and it goes by fast, really fast, more than you, you can expect. And therefore, in that time, you have to really utilize it to the fullest potential and not cause God's kin'ah, right? What's the kin'ah? He knows that He gave you a certain amount of time and He sees that you're wasting it on emptiness and frivolities and, and just complete waste and that you'll never be able to get the time back. It hurts him. Keep yachol, right? Whoever that means. Let's not hurt God. Let's use our time wisely, properly, and be the best people, the best servants of God we can be. Baruch Adonai Amen.